Let us now reread our text for this morning, Revelation 11, verses 14 through 19. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, (coughs) and great hail. Our text this morning constitutes the third woe. The first woe is the fifth trumpet. The terrible locusts that come out of the bottomless pit in the first half of Revelation 9. And then we read Revelation 9 verse 12. One woe is past, the fifth trumpet, and behold, there come two more woes hereafter. The second woe is the sixth trumpet, the dreadful horses that breathe forth fire, smoke, and brimstone found in the second half of Revelation 9. And the third woe is the seventh trumpet. Verse 14 of chapter 11 begins, The second woe is past, referring back to the sixth trumpet in the second half of Revelation 19. Then the text continues, And behold, the third woe cometh quickly, and the seventh angel sounded. That these last three trumpets are called three woes reveals that they bring judgment, desolation and agony upon the impenitent ungodly. But they, and especially the seventh trumpet, bring blessings and glory to those who are in Jesus Christ, the ones for whom he died on the cross, those chosen in him, before the foundation of the world. You could say, beloved, that our text this morning is a noisy text. It includes the blowing of the seventh trumpet. There's a sound. And immediately upon the blowing of the seventh trumpet, there were great voices in heaven. At the end of our text, we read of voices and thunderings. Some of the noises in our text are articulate. That is, they are utterances in the form of words. The great voices of verse 15 declare, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders speak at length in verses 17 and 18. So let's then look at the third woe, the seventh trumpet, this noisy text in our final sermon in the series on Revelation 10 and 11. By considering the blowing of the seventh trumpet. First, the major errors 
We'll look at two here. We can't deal with them all, just two main ones. The eschatological fulfillment, which tells us what the text is really all about, unlike the two major errors. And finally, the joyful utterances of the voices from heaven and the 24 (coughs) elders. The blowing of the seventh trumpet, the major errors, the eschatological or end times fulfillment, and the joyful utterances. The dispensationalists, that's our first major error, they hold that our text initiates or leads into their millennium. Refresh ourselves with their scheme. The next great event will be the rapture, when Jesus Christ will take to himself those saints alive at the time of his first, second coming. Then will follow a seven-year tribulation in which the final Antichrist will be manifest, which will be followed by a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, complete with a literal throne of David, a physical temple, a Zedekite priesthood, blood sacrifices, and the ceremonial law changed a little bit, from the law given by Moses. This literal thousand year Jewish kingdom of Christ will end with the rebellion of Gog and Magog. After which comes the eternal state of the new heavens and the new earth and the lake of fire. Well, let's look at the passage. At the end of verse 15, the great voices in heaven declare, He shall reign forever and ever. But for the dispensationalists, this isn't a reference to the eternal state. This is a reference, first of all, to their literal Jewish millennium. And then the eternal state. But this text says Christ will reign forever and ever, not and he shall reign for a thousand years, followed by a greater reign. If you look at verse 18, two great events at least are mentioned here. The time of the dead. The dispensationalists say that that refers to a resurrection before the millennium. Then the text says, the dead will have their resurrection, that they shall be judged. And there you have a positive judgment, issuing in a reward for God's people, and punishment upon the wicked. The problems for the dispensationalists include that they have several resurrections, several bodily resurrections, future to us now. There's a resurrection before the millennium of some people, and there's a resurrection after the millennium of other people. But the Bible only knows of one future bodily resurrection. These are the words of Paul in Acts 24, verse 15. He says that the Jews have hope toward God, that we have hope toward God, which they, the Jews themselves, also allow, namely, that there shall be a resurrection, singular, of the dead. One future resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. One singular future resurrection of the dead, which includes the just and the unjust. Not two or more bodily resurrections, but one involving the unjust and the just. And this is the teaching 
of the church's earliest ecumenical creed, the Apostles' Creed, I believe the resurrection of the body, not two or more bodily resurrections in the future, and the life everlasting. Amen. Not only do the dispensationists require for their scheme several resurrections, but also several second comings. There is the rapture, which is the first second coming. Then at the end of the tribulation, which is the second second coming. And then there is another coming of God after the millennium, which is a third second coming. But the Bible only teaches one coming, one return, one appearing, one revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. As again our Apostles' Creed speaks about believing in Jesus Christ that is sitting at God's right hand, from thence in heaven he shall come once to judge the quick and the dead. Continuing with the dispensationalist view of our text, namely that it refers to the start of their Jewish millennium, we look at verse 19, which mentions the temple of God and the ark of the covenant. And where are they? The temple of God and the covenant. They're not on earth. They're in heaven. Verse 19 begins, The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple in heaven the ark of his testament. The historicists, this refers to a particular way of reading the book of Revelation so that, more or less, as you move through the book, you move through the history of the post-apostolic Christian church. The historicists don't see the text as referring to a literal Jewish millennium. That's the dispensationalist view. For the historicists, this passage is dealing primarily with something in the past. It speaks of the world after the Reformation. And so verse 15, it's reference to the kingdoms of this, Lord, this world becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, so that he shall reign forever and ever, refer to the kingdoms of this world becoming Protestant at the Reformation. The kingdoms of this world would include England and Wales, Scotland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, the Netherlands, and parts of Switzerland and Germany. The kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. But France, which looked like becoming a Protestant country, had its Bartholomew Day massacre. And the Protestants then became a tiny persecuted minority. And Bohemia, which was largely Protestant, along with other regions of Central and Eastern Europe, were reclaimed for the papacy through the Counter-Reformation and the shedding of a lot of blood. But if you want to go this way, you could say, well, America and Canada, they became kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And Australia and New Zealand, though when they were founded and became more populous, Things weren't quite as Protestant. South Africa. Maybe parts of Africa could be included. But today, almost 500 years after the start of the Reformation, this exegesis looks even more stretched than it did a century or two or three or four ago because the supposedly Protestant lands of Western Europe, where are they today? Some of them are more Roman Catholic than they are Protestant. All of them are more liberal Protestant than they are real 
Reformed or Lutheran. In many of them, Islam is raising its head. And these kingdoms are secular and becoming more and more anti-Christian and more and more specifically anti-Protestant. It would be news, not only to the countries of Western Europe, but it would be news and would even be grossly offensive for them to think that they were part of the kingdoms of Jesus Christ. Imagine a top politician saying that Canada is a kingdom of Jesus Christ. Or the US, or New Zealand, or South Africa, or Australia. Is there any of the 200 and plus countries of the world where you could say, without being lampooned and almost immediately kicked out of office, where you could say as the leader of the country, our country is a kingdom of Jesus Christ. We exist to honour the God of heaven and earth. The joy of the voices in heaven is, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. An everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ in Bohemia. Well, that's already come and gone. Or of the United Kingdom. Or of South Africa. Or of New Zealand. Or of any other country you can think of today around the world. The voices in heaven, if they could look down today and see the state of things in these apostatizing Western countries, would not be saying... The kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to reign and he has been reigning for 500 years. And he's going to reign over them on earth forever and ever. Verse 17 says. Thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. God in Christ took to him this great power in the 16th century and has reigned in these places and these kingdoms up until and including today and will reign in them as earthly kingdoms in the future. Continuing our explanation and criticism of this view, verse 18, And the nations were angry and thy wrath is come means, according to this view, that the Pope was angry when the Reformation came and he lost Peter's pence for a lot of countries. Oh, we undoubtedly was angry. But thy wrath is come. (coughs) Well, there was wrath upon them, yeah. But thy wrath coming in some great, high, climactic sense? No. Then when the passage goes on about the dead, the time of the dead, that doesn't refer to a bodily resurrection according to this view. It means a spiritual quickening. And when it talks about judging so that some receive a reward and others are destroyed, according to this view, it means that a reward on earth for these Protestant kingdoms and the judging is the destruction of Roman Catholicism in those kingdoms. Although in some of those kingdoms, the Roman church is now much stronger than the supposedly Protestant churches, which are a disgrace. And then verse 19, the reference to the temple of God being opened in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant being seen and thunder and earthquake and lightnings. That refers to God's gospel work on earth. And one thinks... Really? Really? No, it doesn't. And in connection with this historicist reading, which applies this passage to the Reformation and onwards, it's worth noting that some use this historicist reading to bring in post-millennialism. So that not merely... Did several countries become Protestant in the 16th century? But that this then is a prediction that all the kingdoms of the earth will become Christian. And that God and Jesus Christ will reign over all of these nations. 
So in verse 15 means the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ he shall reign forever and ever. It means that more and more they're going to be brought in and an everlasting post-millennial glory day kingdom on earth prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Besides these two major errors in reading of our text, we come to the true eschatological fulfillment of it. This passage is not referring to the Reformation in the days afterward, from the 1500s onwards, or to the start of a literal millennium in the future, But in order to understand this text, we need to recall the temporal indicators, temporal means pertaining to time, the temporal indicators from the earlier parts of this series on Revelation 10 and 11. And first of all, we go back to the mighty angel's oath in chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. At the end of verse 6, the angel swears by the eternal God of creation that there should be time no longer, which means that there will be no more delay before the second coming of Christ, when he cries. Verse 7 continues, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, sound his trumpet, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. And the mystery of God is especially the salvation of the entire body of Jesus Christ, including elect Jews and Gentiles. And this is proved by a study of the many New Testament texts, especially in the writings of the Apostle Paul, which deal with the concept of mystery. I'll cite just one in Ephesians chapter 3, a passage we looked at on Wednesday night's class on the Catholicity of the Church. Ephesians 3 verse 3, Paul says, God has made known to me the mystery. And I want you, verse 4, to understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. This mystery, verse 5 says, wasn't known to people in er earlier ages, but now this mystery has been revealed to the apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. Namely, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with the believing Jews and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And then Paul says in verse 8 that he's made a servant of this ministry so that he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable mystery, the unsearchable riches of Christ, verse 8, so as to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which has been hid from the beginning of the world in God, who created all things in Jesus Christ. And our text says in Revelation 10, verse 7, that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. That is, all of the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church of Jesus Christ shall be saved. The mystery is finished. The entire church has been gathered by the word and spirit of Jesus Christ. And the voice of the seventh angel, when it begins to sound, when the mystery is finished, is the blowing of the trumpet, which is the end of this world. That's the first temporal indicator from Revelation 10 through 11. Here's the second one. Revelation 11 verses 1 and 2 deals with the measuring of the temple, the true elect church of Christ, protected and known to him. But don't measure the bit outside that temple. And verse 2 of chapter 11 talks about 42 months. The 42 months begin with Christ's session 
at God's right hand and run all the way to his return at the end of the world to deliver his beleaguered church in the wilderness. We looked at that earlier in the series by comparing the text which mentioned the 1260 days, which is 42 months, which is three and a half years or three and a half times or a time, times and half a time. Then we have the two witnesses in Revelation 11 verses 3 through 13. We had three sermons on this. The two witnesses are the church, the church militant, the church testifying of God's word in Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says that the two witnesses labor for 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, three and a half times, a time, times and half a times. That is the New Testament age from the first coming to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then we have the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet at the end of the world. But it's not only these temporal indicators from earlier in Revelation 10 and 11 that leads to our conclusion. This is also the teaching of the text itself since it proclaims that the seventh trumpet brings a new and final stage in the kingdom of God. I'm thinking here of the two verses that speak of God's taking to himself royal power and reigning over all the kingdoms of the earth in Jesus Christ. Verse 15 again. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In verse 17, the 24 elders say, Thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And in speaking of God's reign, we need to distinguish On the one hand, the rule of his power over all things, which is his providence. And the rule of God's grace over his elect believing people. That's the one this passage is dealing with. And with regard to God's rule of grace, which is also called frequently in the Bible, the kingdom of God. We can distinguish his gracious rule now over his elect in this New Testament age wherein the church is a slighted minority and his glorious rule over all his elect in the age to come in the new heavens and the new earth. And this is what our text is talking about. The kingdom of heaven, the rule over God's elect in the world to come. And that's why our passage and text speaks of the inauguration of God's universal kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. This is God's eternal kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. For he shall reign forever and ever. Handel in his oratorio, the Messiah, was dead right. He quotes this passage near the very end of his famous musical composition as referring to the end of this world, which leads into the eternal state. Because Handel... He wasn't a dispensationalist. But then nobody in the 18th century was a dispensationalist. But then nobody in all of the church's history leading up to the 18th century had ever been a dispensationalist either. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ so that he reigns over them forever and ever at the second coming of our Lord in glory. But it's not only the temporal indicators in Revelation 10 and 11, or even 
the new and final stage in God's kingdom, but it is also the declaration that the time has come, which indicates that our text speaks of the end of the age at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The word time is found in verse 18. The nations were angry and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And the word time refers to time from the perspective of significance, meaningfulness. A specific point in the history of the world has been reached. And this time is described in three ways. It is a time of wrath. The nations were angry. Literally, the nations were wrathful. And thy wrath is come. Same Greek word in both references. There's the wrath of the ungodly nations against God and his church. There's the wrath of God. And guess whose wrath wins? The nations were wrathful. But God's wrath is come. And when is this great time Highly significant time of wrath. A time of wrath when it's both the time of the highest manifestation of man's wrath, ungodly man's wrath, and almighty God's wrath. It's at the very end of the world. The time described as the time of Gog and Magog in Revelation 20, where they're doing all they can to finish off completely the church of Jesus Christ. And God sends fire from heaven in his wrath to destroy them. It's called in Revelation 13, 16 and 19, the battle, the great battle of Almighty God or Armageddon. When all the armies of the world are out to wipe out the church and God in his wrath destroys them. It's called, to take another biblical term, the end of the great tribulation. When hatred of Christ's church reaches its highest point and God in his wrath returns to punish the wicked. And so the all holy God will manifest his wrath in destroying Babylon, Revelation 18. In slaying Antichrist with the breath of Christ's mouth, 2 Thessalonians 2. And on the great day of the wrath of the Lamb, when who will be able to stand and they cry out to the mountains and the rocks and the hills, fall upon us and hide us from the face of the wrathful Lamb. At the end of Revelation 6. The time of wrath. Also called in our text, the time of the dead. The nations were angry or wrathful and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead. And that phrase by itself strikes us as strange. Because with regard to the dead, as to their bodies, time is largely meaningless. They do nothing in their bodies. They're dead. Practically nothing happens to them unless their graves are disturbed. Except that they molder. And they, as to their bodies and their earthly senses, are unaware of anything. The time of the dead. The time of the dead, therefore, is the highly significant time of their bodily resurrection. Now, the dispensationalists have this right. They have more than one bodily resurrection, and they put this one at the wrong time, but at least they recognize this as a reference to the bodily resurrection. This is the time of the dead, the right, meaningful, crucial, momentous time when the dead live again as to their bodies, when the dead are glorified and enjoy a life which they never did even before they died physically. And thus, the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11 is equivalent to the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall, be, shall sound, 
and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. The time of the dead, therefore, is the resurrection day, the last day. The time of wrath, the time of the dead, and the time of judgment. Verse 18 says, The nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And a positive judgment is spoken of first here, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. Give rewards. And when does that happen? The final judgment. The one and only final judgment. In this passage, those who are rewarded are called God's servants or slaves because they have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, owned by him, and live to do his will. We are God's prophets as those who witness to his truth. And the passage may well refer to those who were extraordinary prophets, that is, who spoke directly from the mouth of God. Those who are rewarded are those who fear God's name with a holy reverence and awe, which is the beginning, sum, and total of all knowledge. And they are the small and the great, the people who seem to be something among the church in the world, who get a little bit of credit, the great, and the small, just the little people who don't count in the church even for what they are, or don't count in the world for what they are, and they don't count in the world especially because they're believers. Small and great. The Catholicity of the church, high and low, all will be rewarded, and be rewarded richly, generously, and righteously. And mercifully too. And then there's the negative judgment. The passage goes on to say, that they should be judged and that thou shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the destroying of the earth here is not some sort of environmentalist judgment from God on the throne. It refers to their destruction of the earth in their ungodly dominion over it. Man was appointed over the world to rule over it in God's name and for his sake. And the world... And this is the bit that the environmentalists never get. They deal with the trees and the air and the mineral resources. They deal with soil and crops and animals and oceans. Everything that they touch, they defile and destroy spiritually because they use it in the service of sin. And the text says that God will destroy them who destroy by abusing his good creation as well as destroying his church. Revelation 20, because remember Revelation 11 is an image, a vision, in sketchy terms, and it's going to be elaborated upon and developed later on. Revelation 20 speaks in more detail of this final judgment in these verses. I saw a great white throne, verse 11, and him that sat on it, whose, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, as in our text, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. But not only... Not only the temporal indicators in Revelation 10 and 11, and not only the new and final stage in God's kingdom, and not only the time of wrath, the time of the dead, the time of judgment, verse 18, but also finally, the biblical images of God and his covenant, in that they attain their ultimate reality, that too, points to the second coming and the end of the world as the subject of our text. Think about the temple. And the word temple is like that used at the start of the chapter, the actual building, not, not the courtyard around it. The temple, for most people, was a great building, all right, 
but it was a closed building. They couldn't get in. Gentiles certainly couldn't get in. Most Jews couldn't get in. Only the courtyard. If you were a Levite, you could get closer. If you were a priest, you could get into one part of it. If you were the high priest, you could get in even further. The temple. But then the temple, such as it was, was destroyed in AD 70 anyway. The Ark of the Covenant was even more inaccessible. No Gentile ever got to see it. No Jew, no Levite, no priest could ever enter the Holy of Holies to see it. And even the high priest, as you know, could only get in once a year and that not without blood. And of course the Ark, the Ark was destroyed even before the temple because it was irrecoverably lost at the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 586. And guess what? It's not going to be rediscovered. If they were to dig up the whole of the Middle East, they wouldn't get it. But in Revelation 11 verse 19 we read, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. An open temple. A visible ark of the covenant. And the point here is not, and I hope you already understand this from this series and from your knowledge of Revelation. The point is not that, wow, it's going to be wonderful at Christ's second coming because we're going to see a literal temple in heaven. And we're going to see a golden chest in heaven. Won't that be wonderful? No, no. You've all seen buildings before. You've seen chests. That's not the point. The point is that we will see and experience the reality to which these Old Testament types pointed. The temple. We're going to dwell with the living triune God in Jesus Christ. We're going to fellowship with him. We're going to know him deeply. We're going to have perfect sinless communion with the Father in the Son and by the Holy Spirit. And if that doesn't warm you and you don't find that appealing, then we're going to give you up to dispensationalism and we're going to have you saying, going out of the church, oh, terrible sermon, terrible sermon. I thought we were going to see a chest of gold. I thought we were going to see wonderful bricks. And the minister told me that all it meant was that we're going to know God and live with him forever. Oh, what a let night. And the ark. Seeing the ark. Isn't. Boy if only you could have sneak packed past the porters or the gatekeepers. And one dark night you made it into the holy of holies in the temple. But of course you're 2,000 years too late because it's gone. And got into the temple. Oh yeah you'd have to go back half a millennium before that. In the days before Jeremiah. If only you could have seen it. That's not it. What was in the ark? God's law. The Ten Commandments written on two stones. What was over the ark? The mercy seat. The blood of Christ covering the law of an offended God and making atonement for us. What happened at the ark? Time and time again, Moses would go there and God would speak to him face to face as with a friend. And all of this in the company of the angels who looked downwards and inwards the two cherubs upon the ark. That's what we're going to see. The reality of the ark. It's not that, that God has a greater Aholiab and Bezaliel who's going to make a greater ark in heaven and we're all going to walk around it like the Muslims do with the Kaaba and Mecca. That's not the idea. And not only will we have the reality foreshadowed by the Old Testament types, temple and ark are mentioned here, but we will have the reality of the theophanies or appearances of God that we read of in the Bible. The second half of verse 19 says there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And there you should think first of all of the great theophany or appearance of God in majesty at Mount Sinai. And the great hail Think especially 
of the seventh plague on Egypt. And then these references, these five things, lightnings, voices, thunderings, earthquake, hail. There are many other biblical references to some or most or all of them. In other passages like Habakkuk 3 or Psalm 18 or Zechariah 14 or repeatedly in the book of Revelation itself. So that we are going to have in the world to come the glory of God manifested like as it was on Mount Sinai only greater all the time. Which will evoke Loving awe and admiration from God's people. And when the wicked see this at the coming of Christ, they will feel awful terror and hatred of God. Which brings us finally to the joyful utterances. That is, the believing, holy responses to this from two Parties mentioned in the text. First there is the triumph of heaven. Verse 15. There were great voices in heaven. Saying. The kingdoms of this world. Are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. The triumph. The final form of the universal kingdom of God. Has come. The eternal kingdom of God. The sinlessly perfect kingdom of God. This is triumph. No longer is Satan the God of this world. As is the case today. And you can see it. And it depresses the daylight out of you every time you watch the news. Not only are awful things happening. But the take, the perspective of it all is so unchristian and anti-Christian. The beast... The Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who is ruling over it all. The, the triumph will go up. The kingdoms of this world don't belong to him. They're the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign over them forever and ever. And not just a tiny little sliver, Satan's little season at the end, as the man of sin had them. And the ungodly kingdoms of our day who try to squeeze us and would squeeze us an awful lot harder if they could get away with it because God is restraining them providentially for a time yet. They don't rule either. And their day is short. And like Satan, they know their day is short. And it fills them with wrath and despair. And for us, there is joy in this very thought. The victory belongs to us because Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, has prevailed despite everything all the propaganda from the ungodly world and the false church and the pagan religions and all we have now is the down payment the small beginning of it but the perfect joy and triumph and victory will be ours in the world to come because Jesus Christ is returning he will burn up this old earth with fire Second Peter 3. He will usher in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem will come down from God out of heaven as a bride prepared for her husband. The kingdoms of this world are become. That's what people will shout in that day. The kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the second voice is the thanksgiving of the church. The 24 elders of verse 16, 12 representing the church of the Old Testament and another 12 representing the church of the New Testament, the whole church, seated on thrones, are no longer seated. They're going to praise. They can't just sit there and praise. They're not only, not only kneeling, but they're flat on their faces when Christ comes to do this. Lying prostrate as low as they can get to worship. The four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks. Thanksgiving and worship. 
We thank thee for thy great power which thou hast demonstrated, O God, Lord God Almighty. We thank thee for thy eternity as the God who was and is and is to come. We thank thee for the perfected kingdom of heaven. Because now thou hast taken to thyself all power. And hast reigned in that all other powers who had some strength by thy might have been totally and finally crushed. And the church thanks God too for the time of God's wrath. The wrath must come. It's only right that it come. And it comes at just the right time when the world shows its wrathful hatred against Christ and his kingdom and church. The time of God's wrath. We thank thee, Lord, for the time of the dead. The general resurrection. And we thank the Lord for the time of judgment. The final judgment. Great rewards to some in Christ by grace and terrible destruction to others. And we do that too, that thanksgiving and that worship. Because we're already in Christ and we believe his words. And this, beloved, is the last sermon in this series which takes us to the last day. This is the end of this series that takes us to the end of the world. The end of the world as regards time in this age. And the end of the world too as regards the goal. When the purposes of God are fulfilled. The mystery is realized. And when God will be all in all. Amen. Our Father in heaven. Bless to us thy word. That we may believe it. And that it may give us hope. And strength and conviction. In a world that lives in darkness. Grant this hope also to our children that through it we may overcome the world, for faith is our victory. Amen.